Lord Jesus, you spent 40 days fasting for our sake. Give us self-discipline in our walk. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in Albert F. Pollard's Thomas Cranmer, Chapter 2. Catherine and the divorce of Cat Cranmer and the divorce of Catherine Aragon. This will go on for about 36 pages, starting us in 1529. Of all the incidents affecting Cranmer's life, the most important is the divorce of Catherine of Aragon. The divorce and its ramifications were the web into which the threads of Cranmer's life were woven. Though he, through it, he first attracted the notice of Henry VIII. So he says, to his services in that cause, he owed <clears throat> his elevation to the Sea of Canterbury, the part he played in the Refor English Reformation and finally martyrdom. We have a footnote. It is impossible to avoid the use of the term divorce in spite of its obvious inaccuracy from neither of the two conflicting points of divorce a view was there any divorce at all Henry's view there was never a marriage and the Roman view that there was never an annulment the Anglican view was that Henry the eighth and Catherine had never and legally married, and the so-called divorce was really a declaration of nullity. Roman Catholics, on the other hand, declared that they were legally married, and as the Pope gave sentence to that effect, there was no legal divorce. <coughs> Hence, Hertzfield's treatise on the subject is entitled The Pretended Divorce. Nor indeed does the canon law recognize such a thing as divorce at all. There may be a separation on mensa et toro. That does not destroy the marriage bond at all. Or there may be a declaration that the marriage has been null and void from the beginning. These declarations were common in the 16th century, the complexities of common law affording considerable facil facilities for getting them back to Cranmer. It therefore becomes imperative to indicate as briefly as may be the origin of that episode and its influence on the Reformation in which Cranmer lived and moved and had his being. Without some such introduction, it is impossible to weigh Cranmer's character in the balance or to estimate the effect of his career in English history. Important, however, though the divorce was as the occasion for the Reformation, no theory could be more shallow than that which seeks to represent Henry's desire to put away an unattractive wife as one and only cause. Before the faintest whisper of any such project as the divorce could have reached him, an imperial officer writing from Rome to Charles V on 8 June 1527 alluded to the possibility of the King of England's turning the English church into a separate patriarchate and denying obedience to the papal see. He thought that such a development probable if the imperialists who had just sacked Rome retained the Pope in their custody. And indeed, nothing could be more natural than that England should repudiate a spiritual jurisdiction which moved at the will of a secular foe. The papal claims were tolerable, only so long as the medieval ideal of the unity of the civilized world under one spiritual and one temporal head remained intact. They could not survive the growth of the spirit of nationality and affect the impression that papal powers could be made to serve particular interests. This abuse <coughs> first obtained flagrant proportions when Charles VIII crossed the Alps in 15, 1494 and made Italy the cockpit of Europe. The Vicar of Christ might have looked on with 
comparative unconcern had he been content with spiritual preeminence. But his efforts to grasp the shadow of temporal power involved him in the fray and forced him to side with one and now the other secular prince in order to extend the bounds of his petty Italian domains. In this struggle, his lack of material resources compelled resort to spiritual arms, and the weapons wielded of yore in the cause of faith became pawns in a game which was played with Italian acres for stakes. Temporal princes were branded as sons of perdition and children of iniquity, not because their morals were bad or creeds unsound, but because they stood in the way of papal greed. The Catholic Emperor Charles V told Clement VII that the sack of Rome was the just judgment of God, and one of his envoys proposed that the Pope should forfeit his fiefs, fiefs as the root of all evil. The Pope's spiritual influence contracted as his worldly possessions expanded and his estimation and credit have never increased so fast as in the generation which followed the loss of his temporal power. England, however, was not particularly moved by papal subservience to secular interests, so long as it was merely a question of the increase or decrease of the extent of papal states, or even of the relative preponderance of French and Spanish influence in Italy. But as soon as a matter of decisive importance from England arose, she discovered a striking grievance. <coughs> Spain and France might put up with the prostitution of papal prerogatives in the interests of temporal princes, because the kings of Spain and France were precisely those who benefited by the process. If the Pope was a Spaniard today, he might be a Frenchman tomorrow. But it was safe to say that in no case would the Pope be English. Even Wolsey and Pole were unable to break down the hostile barrier. It was indeed admitted that there should be, as a rule, one English cardinal. But what was one in a body of 40? It is little wonder that the nation repudiated the jurisdiction of a court in which its influence was measured on such a contemptible scale. Such were the conditions that were first brought home to Englishmen's minds by the question of the divorce of Catherine of Aragon. That question was not the cause, but only was the occasion of the permanent breach with Rome. If it had been only ground a difference, there would have been no obstacle to reconciliation after the death of Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn in 1536. Henry VIII had no love for heresy. He'd been brought up in strict adherence to the Catholic faith. You've got to use that word. Why does he say obscurantists? faith, or the retardant's faith. For nearly 20 years, he distinguished himself by the defense of the papal see. He had launched into war against Louis XII because the king had attacked the pope's temporal states. He'd written a book to confute Luther's denial of papal prerogatives, and papal blessings had followed him all his life. Footnote, Sir Thomas More in 1521 urged Henry not to maintain so strongly in his book that the primacy of the Pope was of divine institution. More then doubted that dogma, but later on was converted to it. The importance of the divorce lies in the fact that it changed this friendship into an enmity and alienated the only power which might have kept in check anti-papal and anti-sacerdotal tendencies then growing up in England. But great as Henry's power was, its exercise was attended by such potent effects 
only because it desi decided a balance of other forces alone that would have been powerless against the Pope and the priests. No ruler can affect anything except by utilizing forces which exist independently of his own individual will. And it is idle to deny that such anti-ecclesiastical forces existed in the reign of Henry VIII. In 1512, when Englishmen wished to insult the Scots, they called them Pope's men. And at the same time, the people of London were said to be so hostile to the church <coughs> that any jury would condemn a cleric, though he were as innocent as able. In 1515, petitions were presented to Parliament against clerical exactions. They gave rise to stormy debates. Prelates wrote in alarm of a party which was bent on the subversion of the church and bitterly complained that party found favor at court. Wolsey sought to save his order by urging the speedy resolution of dissolution of Parliament and by refusing, with one exception, to call another for the remaining 14 years of his rule. Henry VIII knew perfectly well that if he chose to quarrel with Rome, he would find abundant lay support. While his divorce was not the sole cause of the breach with Rome, it is equally clear that Henry's passion for Anne Boleyn was not the sole cause for the divorce or origin of doubts respecting the legality of his marriage with Catherine of Aragon. When Julius III was asked in 1503 to grant a dispensation for Henry's marriage with his brother Arthur's widow, the Pope replied that it was a great matter and that he did not know whether it were competent for him to grant a disp dispensation in such a case. His dispensing power had indeed been denied by a general council. It was by no means universally admitted that the Pope was superior to the general councils. There was no doubt that such a marriage was canonically forbidden as sin. Catherine's father, Ferdinand of Aragon, felt it necessary to remove scruples when Henry might what Henry might entertain on the subject. Her confessor was deprived of his post for venturing to suggest doubts in her mind, and Archbishop Warham held similar views. These objections were overridden by Henry's faith in the Pope and a desire for Catherine's dower. The marriage was consummated, so he says, and in all, oh, with Henry VIII, yes, and in all, but not so sure about Arthur. In all, in all probability, nothing more would have been heard of its doubtful validity, but for the extraordinary fatality which attended its issue. Four children came to the pair before autumn of 1415 but everyone was stillborn or died soon after birth. And in that year, it was reported in Rome that the lack of heirs was leading Henry to contemplate the divorce of his Spanish wife. His relations with Spain were strained at the time, but presently they mended and the birth of Princess Mary in 1516 revived the king's hopes of a son and successor. They were doomed to disappointment. Catherine had more miscarriages and stillborn children, but not one that survived. And by 1525, it was perfectly certain that if Henry remained married to Catherine, he must relinquish all hopes of a male heir to the throne. It is difficult to realize what that meant to Englishmen of the early part of the 16th century. For three glorious reigns have long ago, for three glorious reigns have long ago banished any prejudices that it may have entertained against female sovereigns. 
but in 1531, a well-informed foreign ambassador could solemnly declare to his government. Here, footnote one, calendar of Venetian state papers, 1509 to 1519. The interesting and important fact was only revealed by the Venetian state papers in 1866. Before that date, the earliest suggestion of the divorce was believed to have been made by Henry's confessor, Longland, afterwards Bishop of Lincoln. The anonymous author of The Life and Death of Cranmer, Narratives of the Reformation, <coughs> states that Henry was persuaded of the invalidity of his marriage by Longland and his assertion is supported by a letter written in 1532, in which the date of Longland's suggestion is assigned to 1522 or 23. So too, in 1536, the noble northern rebels thought that Longland was the beginning of all trouble. And compare Shakespeare, Henry VIII, where Henry says, first I began in private with you, my lord of Lincoln. Others, persons credited with the proposal, are the Bishop of Tarbes, Wolsey, Staphileo, Dean of Rhoda. So, 1531. A nice picture of Queen Aragon there. Wrote that the laws of England did not permit a woman to mount the English throne. There was, of course, no such law. Nevertheless, that seemed to be the theory on which the succession had been regulated. The Empress Matilda, the only woman who had tried to grasp the English scepter, had been driven from the land after a bloody civil war. John of Gaunt had maintained in Parliament that the crown descended only through males and the Lancastrian kings had in practice made good the claim that Henry IV, the son of Edward III's younger son, had a better title than Philippa, the daughter of an elder. In 1485, Margaret Beaufort was the Lan Lancastrian heir to the throne, that she passed over in favor of her son, Henry VII, who had no job of hereditary right which he did not receive derive from her. Why should Princess Mary's title be any better than that of Barry Buford? And if the attempt of one queen to mount the throne kindled the flames of civil disrife, would not the attempt of another fan the barely extinguish embers of embers of the War of Roses? Other fears reinforced this theory of succession. Englishmen throughout the century had a drop dread of being brought by marriage under a foreign yoke. By that means, Brittany had lost its independence. The Netherlands had been fettered to Spain and Bohemian Hungary to Austria. If a queen ascended the throne, she ran the risk either of rousing internal strife by marrying the subject or promoting external dominion by giving herself and her realm to an alien prince. The divorce of Catherine of Aragon was only one of the means suggested for avoiding the difficulty. Campeggio, who had tried the... who had tried who came to try the case in England at one time, entertained the idea that Princess Mary might be married to her half-brother, Duke of Richmond, Henry VIII's illegitimate son. He appeared to see nothing unnatural in such a union, nor did he anticipate that the Pope would make any difficulty about granting the dispensation. Clement VII himself proposed more than once that Henry should take a second wife without troubling about the divorce of the first. And indeed, there were precedents for such a course, not merely in scripture, but in more recent times. It was not so very long ago since a pope had allowed a king of Castile 
to take a second wife on account of the sterility of the first, under the condition that if he had no children by the second within a specified time, he should return again to the first. After all, it was not the Reformation which introduced curiosities into the law of marriage. The expedient, however, which found most favor with Henry VIII and his advisors was that of setting up the claim of the Duke of Richmond. The patent of his creation in 1525 gave him, much to Queen Catherine's disgust, precedence over the Princess Mary. Footnote here, Ellen P. Volume 4 was claimed that the Pope could legalize marriages between brothers and sisters of full blood. And of course, Popes have often permitted marriages between aunts and nephews, uncles and nieces. He was endowed with title the Duke of Richmond, the bastard son. Is that right? And so, the titles and offices which Get a picture here of Anne Boleyn, long nose, big eyes, no hair showing, with a B bracelet. This is now in the possession of the Earl of Romney. Portrait pictured by Lucas Cornley. <coughs> the legitimate children of Henry the Seventh had enjoyed. And in 1527, the Spanish ambassador reported a scheme for making him king of Ireland. In various negotiations for his marriage, it was broadly hinted that he might safely be regarded as the heir presumptive of England. And Charles V believed that the betrothal of Mary to a French prince in 1527 was mainly designed to remove her from England and from the Duke of Richmond's path to the throne. Some years later, it was thought that the provision in the act of succession, empowering Henry to leave the crown by will, was intended to facilitate its devolution upon the Duke. Before expressing disgust at so violent and expedient, it is well to remember that a hat that a century and a half later, a considerable party in England preferred the claim of an illegitimate, the Protestant son of a king, to that of a legitimate but Catholic brother. This solution of a difficulty, however, had two defects in Henry's eyes. It did not satisfy his conscience in the matter of his marriage with Catherine and it brought him no nearer a union with Anne Boleyn. Now, there's no need to assume that Henry's scruples were entirely fictitious. He's not the only figure in history who has possessed the useful faculty of really convincing his conscience that what was personally desirable and politically expedient must therefore be morally right. He was, moreover, in some respects, a superstitious man, and he could hardly fail to be impressed by the unique coincidence of which he was the victim. Never before had there been such a mortality among children of an English king. Never before had an English king married his brother's widow. With that theological age, men less superstitious than Henry might easily have seen some connection between these circumstances and the scriptural prohibition against marriages such as his. It's one of the ironies of history that writers who maintain most sincerely that Henry's marriage was null in the sight of God and man have sometimes been his severest judges for having dissolved it. The basis of such a position lies, of course, in equitable considerations. Quote, Fiere non debuit factum vale was a common sense view of Lutheran divines on the point, and no court of equity would have granted a divorce 
or its injustice to Catherine was flagrant and unredeemed. But unfortunately, Catherine's case, like all great political issues, was judged not by equity, but by law and expedience. The political advantages of a divorce were pat patent, and the Pope's dispensing power was denied. It was also clear that the marriage was null in point of law. In footnote, the French ambassador du Bellay, afterwards a cardinal, declared that God had long ago passed sentence upon that message, marriage, November 1, 1528. At first, Henry VIII was by no means inclined to deny the papal dispensing power. He was, on the contrary, relying on it to remove an impediment to his marriage with Anne Boleyn, arising from his illicit relations with her sister Mary. He experienced no difficulty in obtaining a dispensation to that effect, and he had some grounds for expecting an equally favorable reply to his demand for divorce. Within his own family circle, he saw ample precedence for such a course. His younger sister, Mary Tudor, had been twice married, first to Louis XII of France, and secondly to the Duke of Suffolk. Both husbands obtained divorces from previous wives without the least difficulty. Louise's first wife had been sent to a nunnery solely because he wanted to marry the Duchess of Brittany and offered his Pope, offered the Pope his support in return for the boon. The Duke of Suffolk's case was still more to the point, for he obtained a divorce on the identical ground on which his brother-in-law was seeking one, namely the invalidity of a previous dispensation. And to at the same moment that Henry's envoys were pressing his divorce, representatives of his sister Margaret, Queen of Scotland, were urging the Pope to annul her marriage with Angus for reasons much more flimsy than those put forward by Henry VIII. Yet her demand was granted without much trouble. Surely Henry might think a powerful king like himself would get one. Footnote. These relations were long believed in England to be a Roman Catholic libel to the assertion that Henry VIII was the father of Anne Boleyn. The latter, indeed, is a fiction, but there's no doubt about the relations between Henry VIII and Mary Boleyn. So Henry thinks a powerful king like himself is entitled to such consideration as his sister and brothers-in-law. His position then did not seem altogether unreasonable, nor did Clement VII treat it as such. But the Pope was still in the grips of the imperialists who pillaged his capital and kept him ignominious confinement in the castle of San Angelo. He could hardly be expected to court ruin by divorcing his jailer's aunt. If the French, now in alliance with Henry, would only advance and deliver him from the hands of his enemies, he would see what he could do. Meanwhile, he endeavored to gain time by granting commissions, which turned out to be worthless. They succeeded, however, in their object. In 1528, the French commander, Lautrec, marched down through Italy, captured Melfi, shut up the Spaniards in Naples. Spanish dominion in Italy seemed doomed to perish. Clement felt himself something more than an emperor's chaplain, and an ample commission was granted to Wolsey and Campeggio to try the case, even if one were unwilling. The other might proceed and pronounce sentence by himself. Now all appeals from the jurisdiction of the Legantine Court were forbidden. The Pope also had written promise that he would not revoke or do anything to invalidate the commission. This was tantamount to a verdict in Henry's favor, 
and he might well think that his case was won. But no sooner had Campeggio started this picture here of Leo the Tent, strong, big nose, dark eyes, Cardinal's hat on, Cardinal's cassock float. Something in his right hand looks like a folded paper. Pictures in uh, the Naples Museum. <clears throat> the fortune of war was reversed. Okay, I think we will call that here. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.